I'm recording, share screen. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started It's 9.02 and then as folks are, you know, uh, logging on, I'll, I'll make sure to like, uh, you know, to let them in. I've disabled the wait room so people can join and, and not interrupt our, my thought process. But um, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Jennifer Ortiz. I'm a faculty member at West LA College in the English department. Um, I started at the district back in 20, 2010. I started as a project match intern um, when Joanna was running a project match. I'm not sure if she's still running it. And, um, you know, immediately I just fell in love with, um, you know, with West. And so I'm so glad that, you know, after I did my two and a half years as an adjunct there, uh, I taught at LA Trade Tech for about six years as a full-time instructor. That's where I got tenure. And then just last year I came back to West and it's been a lot of fun, um, just me working with other equity-minded practitioners. And so some of the terminology that's gonna come up in today's presentation, I will do my best to take a minute and try to explain if, if this terminology is new, but this presentation is filled with hyperlinks and attachments. At some point, um, Leslie, uh, my colleague in the English department is, is gonna hop onto the presentation and hopefully be able to, to help me send you some, some hyperlinks and some PDFs to kind of help you keep up. If some of these terms just, you know, if, if it's difficult, you know, um, just, you know, bear with me, we'll make sure that the presentation is recorded and that we follow up with all of the attachments so that you have more time to peruse and, and think about what we covered today. So I was really fortunate that um, when I was going through my tenure process, my campus hired um, the Center for Urban Education at USC to do equity work. And before this, I didn't know that I was an equity minded practitioner. Um, I just thought that, you know, I cared about students and I tried to relate to them because I was, you know, I was teaching in the neighborhood I grew up in. So, you know, I tried to diversify my, my curriculum and made sure that they were, you know, the voices represented in the reading material, you know, were, you know, visible and present. Um, while I was an adjunct at West LA, I also participated in different inquiry groups like reading apprenticeship, which changed the way I thought about, you know, remediation and the responsibility and really putting the onus on teaching some, you know, uh, I guess what we would consider, you know, some, some different ways to process learning and tap into, you know, students limitless potential to learn and, and really grow their brain. Um, so I've been very lucky because once the pandemic hit, I was asked by the state chancellor's office to do a statewide webinar on redesigning curriculum based on the Center for Urban Education's equity-minded teaching principles. And that kind of spearheaded all this other work for me. I did a very similar training for the Ohio Community College System, uh, for a couple of colleges in Texas, um, a couple of colleges in Massachusetts, and I'm gonna be doing some of these webinars in Pennsylvania as well. And I anticipate that this is only gonna to continue to grow because as teachers, right? Because that's what we are, as teachers, we're really committed to this work and in participating um, in the discussion on how our teaching and our activism and the leadership that we exercise on our campus can move racial justice and equity forward. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and um, again, I, I, it's a pleasure to be here with you and I hope that the information I give to you today is, is helpful. So what we're gonna see today is just a way that I understand um, how I build curriculum for uh, my English classes. Now, I've heard this before, you know, as I've done these webinars across the country, you know, from other disciplines like the math and sciences, STEM. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been asked a lot of questions like, well, is this easier to apply to liberal arts, to history, to languages? And, you know, as research, as I learn more about the research and as I learn more about inquiry, STEM inquiry groups around the country, actually, this is easily applicable to the sciences and the trades as well. 
Um, and again, I can forward you guys some links on, on how different, especially in California, I think there's like 20 campuses around the state that are doing this type of work specifically for math and science. So if we have time, I can open up that study, but it was published in um, the Insider, the Inside Higher Education um, newsletter. Um, and so there is a really great study and the results of, of the STEM work and the equity work that's happening in the state of California. Um, let's see. So as I was participating in um, the professional development this week for Flex Week, I saw a common theme that came up often. And so I felt like it would be a disservice if we don't go over what equity means. I, I From what I gathered, I saw that equity was being um, used synonymously with diversity. Um, I felt like, or from what I was also gathering, I, I got a sense that um, the responsibility to um, ensure that our students are being successful in our classes was being placed to you know, student services or, or tutoring or you know, math tutoring. Um, and the reality is that I would like to challenge us to shift that perspective and just think about how we can empower ourselves to engage in this work immediately in our classes and then how we could scale out that leadership across our campus and across the district. So bear with me, the slides that are coming next um, are new slides, are slides that I incorporated at the end of Flex Day yesterday and at this morning. Um, so if, if, if I'm kind of struggling or I'm a little clumsy around it, I, I would appreciate a little bit of grace. <laughs> So um, I know that during the description or for the description of this workshop, I posted some inquiry questions that I would like participants to consider. Um, and these are questions that I ask myself a lot because I feel like the work, the work I'm doing in my, with my curriculum and my, in my instruction falls into three big pots, right? The first pot for me is how is my instruction of instruction affecting our students? And that includes, you know, curriculum. How am I engaging my professional development to make sure that I'm remaining, you know, um, um, up to date with the newest and latest um, strategies um, to be an equity minded practitioner and to continue to hone my trade? And then finally, how am I incorporating the science around brain development and learning specifically for minoritized students? So to ensure that I'm not participating in any type of um, microaggressions or institutionalized racism. So these are the three pots that my brain is constantly like trying to shape and mold. Um, it's, it's not easy work, I think about it often. You know, whenever I experience some type of cultural activity where I'm like, oh, this would be a great assignment for, you know, my English 101 class. I think about these three categories because I learned, you know, very early on that what I might find interesting and exciting may not necessarily excite students um, or may not necessarily be an effective way to teach them the skills that we're required to teach them, you know, with our student learning outcomes. So if you could just take a minute to review these questions, please use the chat to respond to any of the questions you have an immediate answer for or that you have time to answer. So the first question is, what excites you about your discipline? What's the latest? So this is like, what's the most contemporary thing? And please excuse the typo, I just incorporated this this morning. Um, what's the latest? So what is, what is the new thing that's happening in your discipline? What's happening with STEM? What's happening with astronomy? What's happening with culinary? What are some of the exciting things that are happening in your discipline? Number three, how, when, where do you see the subject matter you teach in your day-to-day? -day? What inspires you about your subject? Number four, where do you see connections between your discipline and what's happening in the world today? And number five, do you think about and incorporate principles of equity, how and what you teach? So take a minute, um, go ahead and uh, you know, feel free to use the chat to respond. Um, 
I love it. So um, I have a Bernie science is never static. Absolutely. COVID is certainly a current event. And so I, it would be interesting. I would be interested to hear more about that. Um, I'm fascinated by the language of change. Absolutely. Language change. I, I realize that, you know, sometimes I'm behind, you know, at, you know, behind the game because students will, will, will use an expression and I'm like, huh, what does that mean? And so it's so creative what, what students constantly do with language. Uh, I teach about climate change and environmental sciences. Absolutely. Very, very timely. And, and Jennifer, I think that this particular topic, climate change and environmental sciences ties very nicely to the curriculum that I'm going to share with you today. Um, texting uses punctuation, public health, yes. This is great, this is great. So I'll give you a few more minutes. I know I'm kind of, you know, <laughs> throwing these questions at you, um, but Again, um, we'll make sure that the presentation is available for you so that you can continue reflecting. So again, like I said earlier today or at the beginning of the presentation, I was listening to a lot of the conversations about equity and how our fellow faculty members understand the term. And I felt like I would be doing um, our participants a disservice if I don't spend a little bit of time talking about equity. Um, I heard a lot of faculty using the term equity and equality interchangeably. And so I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page and understand that they're not interchangeable. So the term equality really does imagine the world is equal. And sometimes I know that at least when I started teaching, I remember saying things like, I wanna teach, I wanna make sure I'm treating all students fairly and equally. I don't wanna give students quote unquote, preferential treatment. And in a lot of ways, I felt like I was, you know, in thinking this way, I was being fair to all students. But in my ignorance, I wasn't acknowledging the fact that we do not live in a world that's equal. Not everybody experiences the world the same way. We can see that in the ways of um, the types of resources that are available, depending on what school district you're, you know, you're enrolled in, um, you know, whether your school has access to the arts, um, has access to uh, AP classes, advanced placement classes, um, even things like, you know, transportation, is the campus accessible? Um, so I, I, I really had to educate myself in this term as well, and understand that when our students come into our class, they're not coming in with a experience that's equal. And therefore, in me imposing this idea of equality, I was continuing to sustain structural racism. And I'll go into it a little bit more as the presentation moves forward. So here's a little, um, um, I'm gonna show you some, uh, some uh, images on how I began to understand equity a little better. And I learn better when I can see like an image or when I can see a text. So I hope that these images that were provided by the Center of Urban, Urban Education are helpful. So like I said, um, the world isn't equal. And so when students come into our class, they're already coming to our class with some of the challenges that maybe some of their more privileged uh, 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 colleagues or fellow students have not had to deal with. So, you know, something like poorly funded schools, you know, less skilled teachers, a counselor that has to deal with a bigger workload, the curriculum not necessarily being, you know, the best of curriculum versus students. And I know that um, Ken, uh, uh, Professor Kendi talked about this uh, yesterday when he talked about, you know, access to um, tutors, access to workshops, scholarships. Um, even generational access to higher ed. So, you know, did your parent or did an older sibling, you know, go to a college or university to orient you on what to expect? Um, and even like your social activities, do your social activities engage in the competencies that you'll need to be a successful college student? So we already know, right, that when our students come into our class, many of our students did not have the privilege 
and access to some of these resources. And a lot of these, those resources impact learning. And so it's not necessarily about the potential or the ability to expand their learning and their brain and their knowledge. It's really about the opportunities that surround them and what they've been exposed to. So um, I thought this was kind of a cool image that represents that. And so one thing that we have to understand is that just even if you go back into history, institutions of higher learning engage systemic racism. We have to understand that, that historically, institutions of higher learning engage in racism. And although, you know, it, community college has, you know, in some ways represented a bit of an equalizer, right, because it's accessible at some point, it was actually truly free. Um, it still doesn't negate the fact that academia is inherently racist. So we know that this is true when we look at academia in the scholarship, it, how it's predominantly white, or even in the faculty. At the same time, there's the relational racism that happens, things like microaggressions or implicit bias, um, the disproportionate remediation, which I know that this is a controversial topic, so just bear with me. The disproportionate remediation um, that AB 705 attempted to address, um, that multiple, uh, multiple measures has also attempted to address. And if we look at the data, we know that the disproportionate remediation has negatively impacted minoritized students. So these are structural things, but also relational things. And by relational, I mean what happens in your actual classroom and your engagement with a student or with students. Um, you know, things like um, not making an effort in pronouncing a student's name correctly. So that would be an example of a microaggression. And there's so much scholarship around um, microaggressions. If you want like a little quick read, um, uh, I would recommend um, a book by Claudia Rankin. It's a book of, 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 uh, of uh, poetry and there's like little like vignettes um, that explain the experience and what you feel when you experience a microaggression. Uh, microaggression. It's described as death by a thousand paper cuts, that even the slightest things, the, the, the smallest slight can, if you experience it over and over and over again, can have damaging consequences. So that's kind of a, a side note. So as I was in these uh, work, in different workshops and in different um, um, you know, small group activities during convocation, um, a lot, I heard a lot of my colleagues talk about, di about diversity. And diversity isn't inherently a bad thing. It's great. You know, it's great to see, to open up your curriculum and see you know, that you're talking about scientists of color, of course, right? And I, and I did this too when I was you know, an, a, a, a new teacher. I remember thinking like, oh, I'm going to use, you know, um, I'm going to use this, you know, this Asian American author and I'm going to use this Native American author and my curriculum is going to be so diverse. And I, I have to say that that is not inherently bad. But if what we're trying to do is engage in structural changes that's going to impact our students that fall within our biggest equity gaps, diversity is just not enough. It's not sufficient. So within the picture of diversity, um, the lens only focuses on bringing more students into an unequal pathway. And so we say, hey guys, you know what? This is the starting point, right? This is the starting line. And you know, because everybody's starting on the same place, everybody's getting a, 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 an equal chance. And the reality is that you know, different people bring different things at this starting point. Um, based on their experiences, based on access and based on privilege. So I thought this was kind of like a pretty cool um, image. And, you know, we could talk about, you know, a, a lot of a lot of faculty talked about, you know, our, you know, our veterans. Um, we talked about our students that are in, you know, our, our um, um, students that are experiencing housing uncertainty, uh, you know, mental health issues. Right, so we know that putting them at the same start line doesn't necessarily mean 
that they're going to be successful and that they're actually being given a real opportunity to be successful in our classes. So this is the best part, right? Equity. So in contrast to diversity, equity redirects resources to the pathways with, uh, with greatest need to fix barriers and intentionally provide support. And one thing that I tried, that I, I, I had a hard time, um, I understood the value of it, right? I understood the value of it. And when I learned this, I implemented it, but it wasn't without um, some anxiety, right? It wasn't without me having, you know, feeling some, feeling some type of way about it. But I did it because as I learned about equity, as I committed myself and, and recommitted myself every semester to learn more and to become a more effective teacher for um, minoritized students, I knew that I needed to collect data. And this is a hard one because as faculty, we know that every semester, every section is different, right? Sometimes, you know, we're assigned a class very last minute. I know I've experienced this, especially with, with COVID and all these budget, you know, all these classroom, all these enrollment issues and they're cutting our classes and stuff like that. You know, I don't want to ignore the fact that faculty are really experiencing, you know, things that don't necessarily, you know, allow us to put our best foot forward. You know, so we're, we might be scrambling to put a, a class that was assigned to us last minute I know that that's one of the challenges that I experienced or, you know, uh, uh, 8705, which I feel like in the spirit was a good piece of legislation, a great way to address unnecessary remediation and remove unnecessary steps and blocks for our student. But did we really think about and discuss with faculty of what that would look like on the day to day? We legislated something that didn't have any real funds behind it. And we had to like, you know, create these like kind of like miracles in our classrooms. And although inherently it did create really positive outcomes and a positive impact for sure, at the same time, it didn't, we did, there wasn't really enough time and there wasn't any money allocated to this piece of legislation. And I do think that we could have done a better job in, in preparing for, for 8705. But that's a side note. So, you know, equity looks at disaggregated data and analysis. And yes, this can happen at the section level, right? So for example, I have colleagues that use data to analyze their semester. They'll have, you know, the beginning of the semester and get a sense of what skills and competencies students are coming into the class. And they'll look at the big assignments throughout their semesters. Those assignments that are testing the SLOs and to see, really analyze the grade book and see what students are turning work in, right? Who, what student turned in that first paper? What student got a passing grade or receive a passing grade on that big assignment? What student didn't turn in their midterm? What student's doing better in their research paper but not doing as, as well in their timed essay? And as they analyzed that grade book, they learned a lot because they were able to disaggregate that data by race and see where were we failing or where were we not being successful. So you can disaggregate data by section number and, and I would encourage you to do that. It's not easy. It's not easy. I tell you, um, in 2019, um, I, I taught after several semesters of not teaching because I was chair I taught a class and when I disaggregated my data, I was heartbroken because, you know, as instructors, the last thing we want to feel is that, you know, we're doing anything to hurt students. And I, I definitely didn't want to do that. So, but it taught me some things that I will share with you today. It taught me some things about myself. It taught me some things about my instruction and my curriculum and how I can be a better person and a better teacher. Um, so goal setting and action planning, some of the inquiry questions that I gave you earlier are a good way to start thinking about these things. Um, uh, faculty and staff training to be equity facilitators. So, you know, Leslie and, you know, the team has been doing, I know my division does a lot of work around this, um, you know, really like, you know, really putting more resource, resources into our toolkits um, so that we could be more mindful and more strategic. 
and inquiry to understand how practices impede equity. So again, I gave you one example. There are so many. Um, one example was how I was addressing remediation, specifically reading in my classrooms. And you know, with with you know, with um, reading apprenticeship, that was very helpful because I feel like reading and and comprehension and critical thinking improved vastly once I started incorporating this form of remediation in all levels. You know, from from the remediation courses before AB seven hundred five, all the way to a seminar class in you know advanced um, English literature. Let me just look at the chat because I, I want to check in with people. Um, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> so I might be talking kind of fast. So let me just make sure I'm not running through this. Just give me one second. OK, no complaints so far. <laughs> All right, so what can we do about this? Right? What can we do about the history of structural racism in higher ed? What can we do about these huge challenges we're experiencing with equity gaps at our institutions? I argue that we can do a lot. We can do a lot because as tenured faculty, specifically tenured faculty, we are in such privileged positions, privileged position in a lot of ways, you know, we earn these things, right? We went to school, we worked really hard, we went through five years of probation, et cetera, et cetera. But we have a lot of privilege and a lot of power because we because of, of participatory governance. We sit in these committees where you know we can sit across administration and really push and really challenge. And you know, just being at West for a year, I noticed that this is something that our faculty faculty body do pretty well. <laughs> um, it's admirable. Um, you know, before I was a, a, a faculty member, I, you know, was a union organizer and a labor rep. So every time I see faculty, you know, kind of doing like, mm, no, I don't think we're going to make this decision unilaterally. We have to talk about it first. I'm just like, yes, <laughs> yes, let's talk about it. But essentially what the following chart shows you is the many facets or the many areas throughout our campus that we have an opportunity to exercise our power, our voice, and to implement change. So this, this, this triangle is something that, um, you know, um, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, and Engenstorm's research shows that our different entry points that faculty have an opportunity to create change. So the categories are as follows. There's artifacts. And so artifacts, I will go over with you today. I'm gonna to show you some examples of my artifacts. And it's not the only way, they're examples, not, it's not the only way. Um, and so artifacts include revising your syllabi, doing a grade book analysis. And so I told you the story about how some of my colleagues look at their grade book to, to, to really analyze where our students are and where we're losing them and low cost, zero, zero cost. And um, I know that this is something that our campus has, um, our district has really been pushing, you know, so that we can make uh, college classes more affordable. In a lot of ways, you know, I'm in a discipline where that's easily possible, right? Doing low cost, zero cost, because there's so many resources for language art that are, language arts that are free um, online. Um, but, and I know for other disciplines, it might be more challenging, especially I would say, disciplines that require some type of state exam, you know, where you specifically have to teach to the competencies of that exam. So again, I don't want to walk through this presentation without acknowledging our individual challenges and the challenges that some of our disciplines may present in pushing this work forward. But what I do want to do is to challenge us to think how we can resolve those. The subjects. So the subjects, we're the subjects, right? You, and other practitioners looking at their data. And so I know that we do um, program review and <laughs> it's so tedious. Um, and we have a lot of uh, faculty members. We have a few faculty members that have been, that have the, the, the angelic patience <laughs> to walk us through this, this process, but it's important. It's important for us to look at our data um, and look to see how not just our courses are doing, but our disciplines and set those goals. We have rules, you know, rules that focus on racial equity. And so best practitioners look at their rules um, 
I was doing, and some of you might be like, oh my God, I can't believe they were doing that, but it's happening, it's happening. I was doing a um, webinar for Massasoit uh, Community College in, in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, in reviewing, I had an opportunity to review different faculty syllabus or syllabi. And, um, you know, some of the common uh, things that came up was faculty asking students for a doctor's note. And so, you know, that a rule like that assumes that students have equal access to healthcare. I know, I know there's some like probably some head shakings and stuff like that, right? So, so again, looking at the rules, not just in your classroom, not just in your classroom, but what are some arbitrary rules that your institution might have that create additional roadblocks for our students? And I believe that the chancellor sent a couple of weeks ago um, a new change to, to financial aid to making, uh, make, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, so I forget specifically what it was, to make um, changes to who qualifies for a specific grant um, and so that it would be easier for students to, to, to get help, to get more financial assistance and support. There's the community, right? So other faculty um, system, students. And so the way that I see community is academic senate, department meetings, those key committees where we have an opportunity to implement change. And so one of the challenges I saw um, and again, this might be a controversial topic, but you know, we're amongst friends, um, is the issue with Chromebooks, right? This has been a discussion we've been talking about. And, you know, are Chromebooks, you know, helpful to student learning? Are, are we helping our students by giving them a device that where they can't necessarily access, that wasn't, cre that wasn't built to write an essay on, right? It's really a device that was built to surf. So really having that dialogue and how can we as faculty use our voice to say, you know what, the district is spending thousands and thousands of dollars on equipment that is not helping students, right? How are we creating these equity gaps? Because, you know, for faculty that don't necessarily um, have a lot of uh, knowledge on technology, you know, if a student isn't following, for example, MLA format, which is the format the, um, that we follow in the English department to write essays, you know, because the Chromebook doesn't allow them to format and we're grading them down or we're penalizing them because one of the SLOs is that they need to know MLA format. We are creating a roadblock unnecessarily because we weren't a part of the discussion on the technology that our students needed in order to be successful in our classes. And this isn't an accusation to anybody, but it is a fact, right? So I'm not saying it's this person's fault or their fault. I just want to focus on, on, on the challenge that we inadvertently, in our attempt to help students, in our attempt to onboard them and to make sure that they could finish their semester during a pandemic, we created an additional roadblock. The division of labor, right? Who, you know, who's putting in the emotional labor and the time to address things like microaggressions. And so when I was chair, this was a, this was a lesson I learned in, in how in developing my own leadership. This was like my first time as chair. I was actually still going through probation when I was elected chair. I hadn't even finished my tenure process. And so, you know, I was still honing my skills as a leader. Um, so I had a lot of learning to do and, and not necessarily tons of mentorship. But I learned how important it is to build your network and that you don't feel that you have to do everything by yourself, you know, that you use your committee work, that you identify allies to do this work. And I think everybody participating in this training is a, a potential ally. And so the object of it all, the objective is to become a more equity minded practitioner. And so these are the individuals that are engaging in practices that specifically close equity gaps. And so your practice has to, in order to be an equity-minded practitioner, your practice has to engage and impact equity gaps. You have to look at the connection. Because again, as I told you before, you know, when I first started teaching, I thought that in creating diversity, in my topics and in my readings, I was doing something. And yeah, I was doing something, but not necessarily challenging systems of oppression and um, really you know, looking at, at, at how uh, you know, racism impacts our students through, through, through structures, through, through, through systems. 
And then finally, and engaging all these facets of this triangle, right, where we as faculty have an opportunity to speak up and we as faculty have an opportunity to, to make change, the outcome is that we meet our racial equity goals, not just for our classes, I would actually challenge for our institution because of participatory government, we can impact everything. So let me just look at the chat very quickly. I'm just gonna check in. Um, I feel like I spent a lot of time on this, but I just, it, I thought it, I would be doing everybody a disservice um, if I didn't spend a little bit more time on this. How many triangles are there in your big triangle? Okay, let me see. How many triangles are here in my big triangle? Let me look at chat. A lot. A lot. There's a lot of intersections. I mean, it really is. It's one. Yeah. I mean, there's I think what was what I was trying to show is that there's tons of intersections. Right. And, you know, you can we can study, you know, at some point what a topic or a term that often oftentimes comes up um, in this work is intersectionality. Right. And so I would say that as equity minded practitioners, we have so many intersections and opportunities to 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 do this work. Um, and so um, let's see. What else do I see? Wi-Fi access. Yes, Wi-Fi access was such a big. <sighs> Thank you for mentioning the efficiency of the technology. Chromebook comments, so true. Yes. Oh. Okay. I'm gonna just keep moving, okay? Cause I, I don't want us to run out of time and I have so much to cover. Um, so in reflecting on this and understanding that I need to be more intentional when I design my syllabi, when I design an assignment, I, I, I constantly look at master teachers and scientists um, to teach me to, to anchor whatever it is I'm doing. Whatever it is I'm doing in my classroom, I want it to be anchored in theory. I want it to be anchored in research so that I know that I'm moving purposefully and that I'm moving intentionally with everything that I do in my classroom. And I mean, in a lot of ways, as I develop my own leadership, um, you know, with everything I do and say for my campus and for my district. And so the three, um, the three master teachers and, 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 and science scientists that I'm gonna focus on today are um, you know, one of my favorites, uh, Paulo Ferrer, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And this is actually an author that I use and I've used in the past in my classrooms. And you have to hear, I love, I love watching how students become more empowered readers and critical thinkers. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit further on. I use the racial equity tools from the Center for Urban Education. If you, if you Google Center for Urban Education USC, these racial equity tools are readily available for you. I did, um, I am going to be attaching, someone mentioned yesterday, I wish they would give us some way, some solutions or some steps that we can take. I got you. There's a little handout I'm gonna send you that gives you some steps that you can follow in your classrooms and in your departments and some specific ways that you can, um, you know, engage in equity work. And um, Sarita Hammond's culturally responsive teaching and the brain. I saw that you know during Flex Week, um, someone is actually covering just this, just item number three: culturally responsive teaching and the brain. So I'm not going to go too much in detail it, but I, I am. I do want you to see how I applied it to this curriculum. Um, the book looks like this. It's not that big. And it's filled with wonderful diagrams that kind of helped my brain absorb what she's talking about. And, uh, and, 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 and one, one of the big values, just as a side note that I took away from, from this is that, you know, Paulo Ferrer is very philosophical. Center for, for Urban Education, the racial equity tool is very scientific, <laughs> but Sarita Hammond actually like puts it in context to teaching to the classroom. And so I love that. I love that she was able to tie it all together for me. Um, so if you can read that, it, it, you can apply her methods and her strategy to any discipline. All right, so these are the principles that anchored my, 
my, the curriculum I will be sharing with you today. So number one, one cannot expect positive results from an educational or political action program which fails to respect the particular view of the world held by the people. Such a program constitutes cultural invasion, good intentions notwithstanding. And I really like the idea of good intentions because as educators, I know we are all coming into our classrooms with good intentions, but we have to make sure that we are encouraging and that we are embracing and inviting a, a sense of partnership with our students and engaging them in their learning. But also, Ferrer talks about a lot about the symbiotic relationship between teacher and student and the fact that teachers are often the student and students are often the teacher and that we have to come into, into spaces of learning, understanding that we don't have the answers to everything and that our students have so much to teach us. Number two, for apart from inquiry, apart from the praxis, individuals cannot be truly human. Knowledge emerges only going through, only through invention and reinvention, through the restless, impatient, continuing hope for inquiry, human beings pursue in the world, with the world and with each other. I felt this particular quote was, was poignant to what I'm gonna show you today. My curriculum is gonna focus on how I use art exhibits or my, my visits to art exhibits to build my curriculum. And so this is a way that I engage with the world and that I want students to engage as well. Um, number three, there's no such thing as a neutral education. Education either functions as an instrument to bring about conformity or freedom. And I strongly believe that. I strongly believe that. You're either working for racial justice by, being, by becoming a more knowledgeable equity practitioner, or you are engaging in practices that support structural racism. And we could talk about that later. These are some of the Center for Urban Education's principles that also guide my work or guide the curriculum I'm gonna show you today. Number one, the urgent issue was to address racial equity and educational outcomes. So this is where the data comes in as a matter of institutional accountability and responsibility. Diversity without equity brought only symbolic benefits for universities, giving no substantive benefits to minoritized students. And again, I've given you some examples of that. Number two, equity-minded practitioners question their own assumptions, recognize stereotypes that harm student success, and continuously reassess their practices to create change. Part of taking on this framework is that institutions and practitioners become accountable for the success of their students and see racial gaps as their personal and institutional responsibility. And I feel like I've kind of tapped into this idea since the beginning of our presentation. And number three, an equity-minded practitioner commits to lifelong learning, actively participates in dismantling systems of oppression, believes in the limitless potential of Black, Latinx, Native American, and other minoritized student groups. That's yours truly. And so I would encourage you that as you learn more about equity, that you, that you put this in your own words, that you, that you put equity in your own words. And I feel like this particular quote, you know, this definition of what it means to be an equity-minded practitioner reminds me that you know this is this is i'm not going to have all the right answers sometimes i'm going to make mistakes sometimes i'm going to roll out an assignment or a piece of curriculum that is not effective but i am responsible for looking at this and thinking about how i can make a change and not continuing to perpetuate um maybe a practice that um disproportionately impacts minoritized students and then finally, um, this is from uh, 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 Sarita Hammond's uh, Culturally Responsive Teaching. And she talks about four practice areas of a culturally responsive teacher. Those four areas are awareness, learning partnership, information processing, and community building. And I think that awareness is important, especially when I was listening to the conversations yesterday um, you know, we there, there's a, there's an importance in understanding the sociopolitical context in which our students are experiencing our classroom. Um, learning partnership really focuses on building trust with students. I included my LinkedIn, my LinkedIn, which is Jennifer I Ortiz. Um, the one college did a great panel on how do you build trust especially in the context of COVID and online learning. And there were some really great tangible tips. So um, I can either have Leslie send you help, Leslie can help me send the link 
or um, you can just you know go onto the LinkedIn page and the video recording of that conversation is there, but just how critical it is to build trust with students so that they feel comfortable taking the risks uh, in your classroom. Information processing. And so really it's our responsibility to develop, to strengthen, strengthen students' intellect, intellective capacity so that they can engage in deeper and more complex learning. I have a little video that I can show you on how I do that. But essentially, you know, I gave students an assignment we had, it was an English 103 class and we were looking at rhetoric and the assignment was to analyze um, the use of rhetorical devices in Letter from Birmingham Jail by Dr. Martin Luther King. And most of the assignments I received were um, uh, summaries and really just more included more, uh, more of like, you know, I understand what he's saying rather than I, I, I see what he's doing. Um, and so in the lecture video, I implement some strategies to kind of push them to take, you know, bigger risks. Um, and, you know, I gave them an opportunity to resubmit the assignment. Hands down, hands down, night and day, night and day, because I, you know, we, we engage in a conversation that kind of flexed their, their, their brain muscles. Um, but it was really giving them the opportunity and not just saying, you got a D, you got a C because you didn't, you know, make the basket that first time. I gave them multiple tries for them to master this skill and they, they stepped up to the challenge and they did great. And then number four, building commun uh, community building. So it's focusing on creating an environment that feels socially and intellectually safe for dependent learners to stretch themselves and take risks. Um, uh, uh, Leslie, is there anything in the chat that um, I need to respond to or am I going too fast? No, I think you're good. We just have like comments that are sort of um, building on whatever you're presenting, but no questions yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I as, as uh, you know, Leslie asked a bunch of us to, you know, participate, you know, on, you know, for Flex Week. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, like I, I need to do a better job at being mindful of the different steps that I take and, and, and building this curriculum. And so these are some of the steps that I took to build the curriculum I'm gonna show you today. So step one, I thought about what is the real life value my course can offer my students. And so lately we've been seeing the, um, the discovery of uh, the, the residential homes or the residential schools where we sent, where this country sent thousands of Native American children and they've been discovering all these graves. And this is something that I've been having a really <laughs> difficult time, you know, as, as it pops up on my Facebook feed or on my Twitter feed, um, you know, we found, you know, 500 more graves, we found, you know, a thousand more graves and, and it's been really difficult. And so the real life value that my course can offer students is an opportunity not only to collect more knowledge, um, but also contextualize it in something that's happening in our world today. And so um, I had an opportunity to go to an amazing exhibit, a masterful exhibit called When I Remember, I See Red. This is an exhibit that's at the Autry Museum um, in Griffin Park right now. And it's an exhibit that specifically is um, deals uh, or includes the art of Native American painters and artists and sculptors. And it, it really teaches us not just what's happened in history, but it provides a theoretical framework in better understanding the Native American experience. And I love it because it's it's tying the, the personal experience with the with the academic theoretical work. And that's one thing that I love to do. I love students. I love showing students how they can, how they have full range and how their personal experience actually has a space in academic work. Step two, how my practices and curriculum support equity goals and student learning. And so um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit when I um, go over um, my syllabus with you. Number three, how am I building trust by demystifying, creating partnership and deconstructing my courses? Where do I incorporate the student voice? I have some student videos that I can show you. That's probably like the best part of the presentation. 
Um, and so just an example of demystifying, you know, a lot of us send um, welcome videos to our students before the semester begins, and we actually tell students what they're going to be learning. Um, we tell students what the learning platform is. We demystify the, 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 the anxiety that they, they may be experiencing in entering our classrooms. We create partnership and I'll show you um, during the pandemic, I, I, I normally have students come into my office hours all the time, but during the pandemic, students weren't coming to my office hours. And I kept thinking like, oh, how can I get them to come to the office hours? Like, I don't want them to think, think that they can't pass the class. Like we can work through this. And so what I did was I asked, um, you know, that one student that did show up because I was like, you know, please come to class. Like I, I come to office hours, I can show you how to fix this. If you come to office hours, we can do it together. And then, you know, that one student turned around and told other students. And so more students started trickling in to office hours. And so I asked them to make a, a, if they can make a little short message uh, for their fellow students to encourage them to attend office hours. And it made a huge difference. It was, it was easier for students or was more credible for students to hear from their fellow colleagues than to hear it from me. So that was an example of creating partnership. And then deconstructing my course, looking at the data, analyzing what students I'm losing and when I'm losing them. And um, step four, what's in my toolkit? That's the professional development, that's the books, that's the inquiry groups, right? Like what is in my toolbox? What is in my toolkit? What do I need to add? What is outdated that I need to remove? So. You know, an example of that, I'm going to say it. an example of that is the, all the science around grit and growth mindset, right? That in the beginning, you know, we were like, yes, grit, growth mindset, you know? <laughs> and then we later learned that, you know, when we talk about grit and growth mindset, we're not considering race and racial justice um, and specifically minoritized students because they're already inherently gritty, gritty. And I'm using Gritty um, in the context of Bettina Love, who's a scientist that does all this research around it. And again, I can send you that. Um, so I had to remove that from my toolkit. And I added Sarita Hammond, right? So look at your toolkit. Look at, look, at, look at what you have in that toolkit and how it's informing your work. And if you're keeping it up to date. And then finally, how am I building onto the learning skills while maintaining high standards? All right, Claude Steele, let me tell you about this guy. Dope scientist. So when I was doing um, FTLA, which is a program that's ran out of our district, um, it's a program that's overseen by Deborah Harrington, who's dope, awesome. Um, and when I was, I learned about Claude Steele in working with her and in participating in, the, in this teaching academy. And Claude Steele talks about stereotype threat. And essentially what research shows is that the best teachers, the best teachers, when working with minoritized students, students of color, Black, Latinx, Native American, minoritized groups, the best teachers maintain rigor, but also make sure that students understand that they can be successful. So that, that comes in line with creating partnership, building trust, establishing community, so the best teachers do not compromise rigor. What they do is that they simultaneously do all these other things as well. And they do, they do them at the same time. And what his science showed or what his research showed is that those were the students that tended to, those students of color tended to be successful. So there's a whole science about that. Um, it's 9.56. I'm not gonna have time to show you the video but Claude Steele, the link is there. We'll make the presentation available. His lecture is only eight minutes. You can also go on YouTube and type Claude Steele, stereotype vulnerability. And there's tons of free lectures where he explains this in, in a more articulate, in a more articulate uh, effective way. Hello everyone, welcome to English. Ah. You're gonna be reading a- Okay, so. This is the video that I was mentioning to you that I asked different students, could you please make a little video message that encourages your, your fellow colleagues to come to office hours? Um, three of these students, three of the four students that you're gonna listen to today were students that were dropping. I got that email 
professor, thank you for emailing me 15 times <laughs> and for calling me, um, but I'm going to drop. I don't think I can do this. So, so I just want to share this with you because it's just, they're, you know, they're the best. <laughs> they're the best. A lot of interesting pieces of writing and being able to deeply discuss them with your classmates. If you guys are missing assignments or if you guys need a little bit of extra help don't be discouraged to reach out to Ms. Ortiz she will do anything she could I had a little bit of difficult time getting things done for her classes and she was able to help me all the way until those assignments were completed it's surprising me just checking in with you guys heads up you guys are falling behind in class if you guys need help reach out to Ms. Ortiz Ms. Ortiz is going to work with you and she wants to see you pass. So don't be afraid. I thought, I'm too old. I'm not smart enough. It's new technology. I thought, I can't do this material. I'm not a writer. And I had missed a couple of classes and I was ready to drop the class when I reached out to Professor Ortiz to kind of let her know what was going on. And, you know, I was so afraid to ask for help. And I know that. Uh, sometimes with being online and not being able to have the professor right there and ready available to ask questions, some people may get a little nervous about it. You know, she was so supportive and so accommodating and she encouraged me to not drop the class. Again, if you have the opportunity to do online learning, just do it, just push through, don't give up, you know, reach out to Professor Ortiz, she's available for you uh, to answer any questions to encourage you, she just wants you to learn, um, and she wants you to be engaged in the class. So I didn't make this video because I'm not technologically astute like that. Um, this is something that Michelle Longcoffee helped me put together. I just happened to throw all the files at her and she was like, okay, I'll help you. And she put it together and she made this beautiful thing. So I just want to make sure that, you know, you understand. I don't, you know, I don't know how to do that. I ended up getting help from one of our colleagues. And so I want to show you how I incorporate, um, these uh, museum visits that inspire me and that have really been providing a lot of comfort and in, 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 in these difficult times. Um, and and I'm, I wanna share this with you. So uh, when I first transferred to, to West, um, you know, I had worked with um, Polly, you know, as an adjunct and I came back and, and again, I had been out of the classroom for so long that can you guys see this can you see the syllabus yes okay cool yes. i had been out of the classroom for so long that i had to learn new things right and one thing that i learned was the liquid syllabus so i ended up designing um my liquid syllabus under popular me which is a free site for for teachers and it's 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 a, it's somewhat accessible. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I did have some challenges with it, but eventually I figured it out. Um, and so this is what my English 101 syllabus looks like. And this is the, a liquid form of my syllabus. Um, the curriculum is based on Charles White's um, definite, uh, basically what informs his, his uh, art. Um, and he talks about, um, you know, his work having universality to it you know he de uh, I deal with love hope courage freedom dignity the full gamut of the human spirit when I work though I think of my own people that's only natural however my philosophy doesn't exclude any nation or race of people and so um, the curriculum in my class we deal the first two weeks of the semester we deal with the topic of love and I remember when I was doing a, a webinar for um, a college in Texas you know them saying they talk about love in your class and i'm like yes but the way that i make it scholarly is that they also have to read bell hooks and you know bell hooks is one of those master teachers philosophers and she has an article called um she has an essay called um love as the practice of freedom and she does a lot of theory in there so they're able to connect what they're what what what's happening to them when it comes to love to this theoretical framework um, so this is a this is what it looks like. Um, I've embedded my welcome video for the fall. Um, I'm gonna 
Hello, if you're receiving this message, it is because you are registered for one of my English classes. My name is Professor Ortiz, pronouns she, her, hers, and I want to welcome you to fall semester 2021. So I'm not going to play the whole video. I can send you the links where you can watch it yourself, but essentially this is what it looks like. You know, aesthetically, this is the art I saw when I went to go see this exhibit. Um, I, you know, added the hyperlinks so that students don't have to look for this information anywhere. So you know, my, my courses are zero cost. So the link to the free textbook is on the syllabus. Um, you know, I give them some tips. I have a YouTube channel that I hyperlinked onto the syllabus as well. All of the student services and learning services have live buttons so that all they have to do is push them. And if they're, if they're looking at this on their phone, it just makes things a little easier because of COVID. We know that there are some struggles with being able to print or download PDFs on the Chromebooks. Um, I just can't get over the Chromebooks, okay? I can't get over it. Um, and so this is what my liquid syllabus looks like. So shout out to Marini, shout out to Holly for the workshop that I went to and I saw how they do this. Um, so yeah, that's, this, is, this, is, this is what it is. So let me get out of here. So let's say, you know, you're like, you know what, the liquid syllabus looks like something I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not ready for that. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. I don't know if I have the time. Let me show you what a PDF version looks like. So do you see these, the, the image? Um, English 103. Okay. So this is what a PDF version looks like. If you don't have a time to, to, to do the whole liquid syllabus, this is what it looks like. Um, this is specifically, um, um, inspired by, you know, when, you know, when I remember we see red, which is the exhibit that's outlined or the visuals that you see in my presentation are from this exhibit. Um, and essentially, you know, it does the same thing. It's, uh, you know, it has a, a cover letter. Um, I also incorporate music in my classrooms. I, I'm going to show you what that looks like, how I incorporate music, but how does the art exhibit fit into the stuff that we're learning in class? So the principles in this exhibit, um, all throughout the exhibit, they look at tradition. They look at cultural reclamation. They look at activism. And so this is the terminology. They look at advocacy. They look at cultural resistance. And so um, the way that this curriculum is going to be broken up is going to be broken up in four sections. Um, and the ideas are going to inform the different things that we're going to learn um, throughout the semester. So this is what that looks like. It's still in um, it's still in draft form because I'm still developing it, and I'm not teaching English 103 right now um, this semester. I'm not teaching it, so. Um, I wasn't going to spend too much time and, and, I'm, and I want to take my time processing um, the curriculum and designing it. All right, so thank you for participating and coming to my webinar. I hope that the things I said today were helpful to you. I would love to continue the conversation, but we're at 10.05. That gives us 15 minutes. But before I you know, shut all this down, I wanted to end the presentation with a student voice. Um, so let me give this to you real quick. Sorry, it takes a minute. This is another student that took my class during COVID. Um, this is another student that, you know, was telling me he didn't think that he could pass the class, that he didn't want to stay enrolled in it, um, that he had way too many things going on. Um, and so because I was, some, you know, I gave him some flexibility on the due dates, um, you know, right at the end of the semester, he, he like blazed through the, the finish line. <laughs> um, and it was really just giving him some, you know, giving him some empathy and some patience. And he met, he met the challenge. And, you, you know, as we all know, this is what our students do, right? This is what they do. Hi, Professor Ortiz, English 101 class. I just want to give you guys a few uh, tips and stuff on what helped me get through our class and succeed. Uh, one would be the notifications on the Canvas app. I will put it on my phone and like the little to-do list, it will have like bubbles there. So like if you have one, 
two or three assignments due, they'll say one, two, three, just like how you, you got a text message. So I know if those bubbles were not there, then I completed my assignments. So I just kept checking, like, you know, every time you get on your phone or whatever day, like, oh, okay, oh, there's a new bubble there, what assignment is due. Mm -hmm. That helped me. And um, as far as organizing, like, uh, this, the articles you have us read, you know, for discussions or um, the essays you got to do, what I would do is I would organize separate notes on each piece of information, whatever article, whatever video, have my notes, have my quotes already down. And then I make the works cited page first. Whatever I'm using, I got the works cited page first, and then I got all my notes organized. So even if I use, uh, you know, if I go through an essay or whatever, I would use the information, then I'll go back and look and see what uh, information I got which from. So it's easy to cite, you know, if you or, uh, organize the information that you use. So I think that helped uh, complete the essays definitely faster, you know, and be able to sort of cite it correctly. And yeah, I think those, those are pretty much it. Just making sure you stay on top of the notifications and organizing the cited information uh, definitely helps. So good luck, you guys. Hi, Professor Ortiz, English 101 class. I just want to give you guys a few uh, so, tips and stuff um, on that's, what that's, helped me uh, get through your class and succeed. That is my uh, uh, presentation. The... <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> so um, I'm uh, open to uh, to looking at the chat and, and addressing some of the the questions that, you know, or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for getting a lot of love and thank yous in the chat. Um, there are just a few like little logistical questions. I think Bernice and Michael had a, like a similar, um, similar question about um, how do students in your class view the student videos? Like, how do they have access to them? Um, the student videos are embedded onto my Canvas shell. Um, and so you saw that I've uploaded them on, onto my YouTube channel that creates a hyperlink. And I take the hyperlink and embed them onto, um, onto Canvas. So they'll get that message. I, I, I don't know if you, got, if you want me to show you what that looks like. I mean, I think, I don't know, examples are so uh, helpful to me. So um, yeah, so yeah. So I basically use my Canvas shell as a way to, um, you know, embed everything. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I created a YouTube video just for like my teaching. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of separate from like my personal YouTube. That might be a good way to. Um, yeah, yeah, you know. I uh, definitely am very, uh, I have two different YouTubes for sure. Yeah, just a tip if yeah. <laughs> you all are thinking of doing this. Yeah, we don't want to, we don't want to, uh, 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 oopsie. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so this is what my uh, Canvas show looks like. Um, the, here's an example of how I embedded a, a hyperlink. Um, this is my welcome message. Um, when I go to modules, which is how I organize my class. So the first unit is on love. And so, for example, I'll have a, um, a lecture on paragraph format. So you just embed the, the link onto, for me, I like to embed it on the page so that I can give them a due date of when they have to watch it. They don't have to do anything. All they have to do is watch the video um, and take notes. So that's how I do it. A quick question. Uh, does anybody know if we are able to track how many people watched a video if we had something embedded there or we don't? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is the fun part. Okay, yes. So that lecture video on paragraph format has like, I think like almost 2000 views. Whoa. So what that tells you is that students are clicking you know, I would say they're clicking several times because they may not have necessarily absorbed the information. I know I have to watch things several times. They may not have necessarily absorbed the information the first round, but they can keep playing it. 
right? And then um, any assignment that requires them to write in paragraph format, I'll embed the video again in that assignment so that they don't have to go somewhere else. So every discussion requires them to, to do something in, in, in paragraph format. So, you know, it'll have the question, the reading, and then it'll have the video that reminds them how to do paragraph format. The number is just for this semester or over different semesters? Or do um, you also see how, how many different users or is it just a number? Is it related to the actual student somehow? Oh, specific to the student? Um, no, I don't think that uh, YouTube has that capability. Okay, thank you, good to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that I can answer? We have uh, eight more minutes. I do. Um, hi, thank you so much um, for presenting this information. I want, if you are able to kind of demystify for us this idea that we're deviating if we're including uh, our voices in the curriculum or our students' experiences in our activities and assignments. Um, I've heard this sort of deficit-minded idea or concept of, you know, there's this course of um, course outline on record, you know, we already have these textbooks that are offered. You know, how do we, how do we um, clarify for faculty that it's adding value when we do this and that, yes, it may take more work to be intentional and deliberate and it's necessary that we do honor uh, the scholarship, the research, you know, that comes from our communities. Could you speak to that a little bit more? I would say, how's that working for you? How's that working for you? Is it giving you the outcomes you want? Are students, are students creating the product that you want them to create? And if it's not working for you because you're not able to keep students in your classrooms or because students are not passing your assignments or not passing your class, then the onus is on you. Because as a teacher, you have to teach to the student that's in your class. So I would start with that. How is that working for you? How are these traditional models or this deficit mindset of seeing things and seeing our students? How is that in creating success and your success as a teacher? Um, and then the second thing I would do is I would think, you know, I would ask the question is, do you really feel like there's nothing you can learn from students? Do you really believe that? That's, that's, that, those would be my responses. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Any other uh, questions I can answer? There's uh, six more minutes. So feel free to um, just jump in. I guess, you know, let me just say that this isn't something that I did overnight. Like, like I said, this has been something that I've been working on since 2010, when I started as an adjunct um, in Project Match, and then FTLA, and then going to conferences, and then learning, you know, from my colleagues, you know, this isn't reading books. So I don't want people to feel like this is something that you can produce overnight. Um, I've had to work really hard and have worked for a really long time to make this type of, make these things possible um, and to create this as, as you saw, you know, the new curriculum based on this last art exhibit isn't even finished. I'm still working on it because I barely saw the exhibit during the summer. Um, and I'm not teaching English 103 this semester. So I don't, I want to be mindful that, you know, faculty, um, and particularly our part time faculty, our adjunct faculty, um, you know, this is, this is, you know, this takes a lot of time and I don't want to minimize um, what we're already going through as human beings, you know, as people, um, and also in our respective roles as, as, as teachers.
um, is, is, are there, um, I think we have four more minutes, um, you know, however I can be a resource, I'm here. Uh, Bernice? Yeah, I, I just want to comment. I've been using this term window into your mind and I, and I, whenever you write something down, it doesn't necessarily convey the meaning that you want it to convey. So I just want to make sure that you understand that I think you use your graphic organizer beautifully. That triangle thing, it's just wonderful. It is a window into your mind and you're expressing all of this stuff in a very wonderful manner. And I find it extremely enjoyable. Thank you. Thank so I just you. want to make sure that the point that I'm trying to make with these expressions are getting across. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And we're all learning in community too. I don't have all the answers, but I, you know, I'm always open to sharing um, what I've learned and definitely what I'm struggling with because again, every opportunity is an opportunity to learn something new. Any, any, anything else I can help folks with? And if any of these things, um, you know, you're interested in any of the things that I that I mentioned that we didn't have a lot of time going over, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. It might take me a little time to respond just because I'm still prepping for fall semester. Um, but definitely when things kind of simmer down for me, maybe like two weeks into the semester, I can begin sending some of this stuff out. Um, and, you know, you know, being open to dialogue. Uh, on how we can, as of campus and as faculty, how we can move forward, forward with this work. Thank you so much. This has been really great. I think I'm going to have to um, bug Michelle to, to create that video that you made with the student voices. I thought that was fabulous. And I think that's a really great idea, not only for the students creating the videos, but for them to uh, the impact that it has on on the other classmates to be able to feel like okay they did it I can do it this is a safe space and I really agree with what you said about fostering a an environment where students feel comfortable to take academic risks That's so important absolutely right. absolutely and I mean we have very talented people and Marini you and Holly were the ones that you know did that whole work on the liquid syllabus so, <laughs> I can't take credit for that I was putting in the chat to Bernice I'm like I'm looking at um the, the link that Leslie put in the chat and yours too, yours look way better than my liquid syllabus. So I need to brush up my skills on the liquid syllabus. So, but thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, like you guys, uh, you guys are out here doing the work and, um, you know, I'm learning from each and every one of you. So well, this was very inspiring and insightful. So thank you, Jennifer. You're welcome. Yeah, you know, Marini, uh, Holly responded to me about the liquid syllabus being tied to the Google site. And I'm a bit familiar with that because I have engaged with some, someone else in, in that process, but it was the name, something about popular, something or other that I didn't know. It sounded like it was different from just the Google site uh, liquid Yeah, <clears throat> that's mine. I, I use popular me. You can use Google, of course, um, but I, I, use I It's your popular me that I'd like to have the, at least a URL or if I Google popular me, will I get it? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. and it's, just, it's, actually, it's actually spelled um, kind of weird. <laughs> um, it's not spelled, you know, grammatically cor uh, correct, but um, what I'll do is- P-O-P-U-L-R. That particular reference, and that was why I was curious. But um, yeah, okay. Um, let me uh, figure out how to- The P-O-P-U-L-R dot me. Okay. One cool. more time, Michael. P-O-P-U-L-R. Uh -huh. Not me. Okay, thank you. P O P U L R dot. What was after the dot? Mm -hmm. uh, hang on. Not me. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, yeah. I sent the, the link to mine too, and it has the spelling <clears> on there. <throat> Great. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. You're welcome. Okay, <clears throat> well, it's 10 20. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody, <clears throat> for supporting the webinar. And great one last, and one last question. Do you, uh, uh, are you going to send uh, this presentation, I mean, um, um, workshop to our uh, schools? I'm yeah, I'm going to, I, I think uh, <clears throat> Leslie puts it all together for us, and um, it, this is also being recorded. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. <clears throat> I have to leave. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you again. This, I, yes. I enjoy listening to you a great deal. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for coming.